Ladies and gentlemen, um, good afternoon again. Um, for those of you who don't know um, Barney, I uh, have a few words about you here, Barney. Sorry to do this, but uh, practiced commercial law for six years before joining the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade in 2001. Some of his appointments include postings in New Zealand embassies in Tehran, Geneva, and ambassador to Egypt from 2014 to 18. Barney is currently a lead negotiator in the MFATS Trade and Economic Group, responsible for the New Zealand trade negotiations with China, with RCEP, and the GCC. Barney, welcome. I think the intention was for us to have a conversation about the bedding down of the next chapter, the FTA, up, the FTA upgrade. So how about we start with you making some, some comments? Um, we have time, you have questions. I look forward to getting the questions on Slido. Thanks very much, Michael, and um, kia ora everyone. Um, perhaps just to start off with, it would be useful just to recall why we commenced the upgrade. Um, as we've heard today, the uh, original free trade agreement between New Zealand and China was signed in 2008. And it's been incredibly successful, really, by any measure. Um, other speakers have talked about uh, the growth of uh, our economic relationship. <clears throat> um, and I guess the, the, the headline uh, metric is that um, when the FDA was signed in 2008, uh, two-way trade was about um, eight, million, uh, 8 billion, I think. Um, today, uh, in 2020 anyway, um, two-way trade has more than quadrupled. So very successful, uh, and it's clear that uh, the trade relationship, the business relationship, um, has really um, blossomed um, off what was uh, a first for China uh, in the sense of a comprehensive trade agreement with a developed economy. So why then did we need to go through what was quite a long process um, of negotiating an upgrade? And I'll just sort of paint in this context. Um, I think it's useful um, in order to also judge uh, what we achieved from the upgrade, because like any negotiation, of course, uh, we didn't achieve everything that we set out to. So the thinking in launching the upgrade, uh, which was back in about 2015, I think, from memory, um, there were a number of factors. First, there was some unfinished business from the original negotiation. The original FDA was um, an extremely uh, high ambition agreement. And for example, if we look at the level of tariff elimination under that agreement, uh, the 2008 FDA uh, is actually one of New Zealand's best. It eliminated tariffs on New Zealand's exports um, up about 97%, perhaps 98%, depending on the, the value of, of any given year um, of New Zealand's exports, um, able to enter China duty-free. So that's, um, you know, that's an extremely um, high level. Um, but there was some unfinished business. There was some unfinished business on the tariff side, uh, in particular some products which were effectively excluded from the original negotiation because they were very sensitive for China at the time of that negotiation. Of most relevance for New Zealand, uh, that included uh, wood and paper products, um, but also some dairy products, uh, which under the original FTA um, continued to be subject to some constraints from tariffs uh, under what are called safeguards. So there was uh, tariff elimination uh, on all New Zealand dairy products, but for some products, uh, the tariff elimination was only up to a certain volume. And so when that volume was hit, in any given year, then the safeguard uh, would apply and tariffs would apply. So there was some unfinished business. Also in the intervening years, uh, with our experience, businesses' experience, businesses were talking to us uh, and telling us about you know, some new barriers, some non-tariff barriers that they were experiencing uh, and wished 
to try and have those uh, remediated. Uh, as I said also, uh, New Zealand was China's first uh, comprehensive uh, high quality FDA and that did give us a head start. Uh, but in the intervening years, China has negotiated many more FTAs, uh, including with uh, New Zealand's competitors. And in those intervening years, and some of those more recent FTAs that China has negotiated, uh, some of our competitors got um, slightly better conditions in some areas, in particular uh, in relation to some of China's services commitments. So for all of these reasons, we wanted to negotiate um, an upgrade. Um, We've heard a lot today about the importance of relationships uh, with doing business in China, and of course it's no different um, between governments. So the government-to-government -government relationship, our economic relationship, uh, also needs to be maintained. We need to invest in it uh, to keep it healthy. Um, and so um, the upgrade was also an opportunity to do that and to bring in some additional elements uh, into the FTA, which were not included back in 2008. Um, and these were areas uh, that were not included, sometimes because they weren't particularly relevant back then. Uh, E-commerce is an example of that. Um, but also other areas uh, that were too sensitive for China uh, at the time the original agreement was negotiated. Uh, but with the passage of time and the development uh, in China and of its trade policy, uh, China was now in a position to negotiate these areas into the FTA. Um, and we wanted to do that through the upgrade as well. So um, all of that was the reason that we uh, launched the negotiations, uh, which lasted about three years and concluded in 2019 uh, with the upgrades signed uh, at the beginning of this year. I have to ask this, I hope it's not stupid, but <clears throat> when I look at free trade agreements, um, the one that we um, skied about more than any is the Australian one. How, how would the two, if you set them alongside each other, how does the China one look by comparison to the Australian one? I think CER is um, certainly New Zealand's um, most comprehensive trade agreement, and it's much more than a trade agreement, of course. Um, if we just look at the narrow trade elements of it, uh, CER is uh, fully comprehensive, it eliminates uh, all tariffs on all products. Um, it pretty much opens up uh, services markets without limitation in each country. Uh, but of course, CER is much broader than that um, and uh, includes um, you know, many other elements in the single economic market. The New Zealand-China FTA um, is a free trade agreement, so it's narrower in scope. Um, and so probably a more relevant comparison is some of our other free trade agreements, for example, um, our trade agreement with the ASEAN countries, um, ANSFTA, um, our trade agreement with Malaysia, CPTPP, um, those kinds of agreements. Um, at the China FDA certainly um, measures up very well um, in that comparison. Uh, in terms of goods market access, um, it remains one of our best actually, mm. um, with as I said 97-98% um, uh, tariff elimination on New Zealand's exports. Um, slightly improved uh, through the upgrade where we um, were able to achieve additional tariff elimination uh, on some New Zealand exports of forestry products. So um, in the big scheme of things, um, it was a very high ambition uh, when it was concluded in 2008. It's a little bit step, uh, step higher now after the upgrade. Uh, and overall it remains, I think, one of New Zealand's best FTAs. So I'm sitting here and you tell me that there's been an upgrade What's the visible sign to me as a, someone doing business with China? What's a visible sign that you've been at work? So, if we think about the benefits of the upgrade uh, and what the outcomes mean, I think it's, um, I find it useful anyway to sort of put them in two different baskets. Okay. Um, one is around the direct commercial benefits that businesses um, will find. Um, and then the second group of benefits is more about the strategic benefits of the upgrade. Um, so I'll talk about each of those briefly. Um, probably the first one is most relevant to your question, Michael. The commercial benefits, so the, um, you know, the improvements that businesses can expect to see. Um, as I said, um, there were some uh, 
uh, admittedly quite modest uh, additional tariff outcomes in the upgrade. So our forestry exporters will certainly uh, benefit from that. Our goods exporters generally uh, will also benefit from improvements to some of the rules of the original FTA that were negotiated. Um, and these are to address um, non-tariff barriers, some of the constraints and the rules that our businesses were reporting, uh, you know, sometimes were a problem with exporting to China. Um, I'll give you some examples. These are quite, um, you know, they're very, very practical, uh, on their own, quite small outcomes, um, but together um, will, I think, flow through to uh, easier uh, trading um, with China, making it cheaper, more streamlined to get goods to market. Um, for example, under trade agreements, in order to get the benefit of the rules, uh, for example, the tariff preference, um, a New Zealand exporter needs to prove that their product is a New Zealand product. Um, and so that's what's called proof of origin. Under the original FDA, in order to prove your origin and prove, prove that your good was a New Zealand good, uh, exporters um, are required to get a certificate from a third party. And traditionally, uh, typically, it's like a chamber of commerce or something like that. Um, and the third party needs to um, you know, look at your supply chain, your manufacturing, look at all of your inputs, um, and effectively um, certificate that um, you meet the rule of origin under the FTA. That, of course, um, is an additional step that exporters have to take. Um, it takes time, it costs money. What we've done in the upgrade um, is negotiate with China acceptance of self, what we call self-declaration of origin. So that, what that means for most New Zealand exporters, um, rather than getting a third party certificate of origin, they can simply make a declaration um, on their export documentation and China will accept that, um, unless they have reasons to doubt uh, that there is fraud, for example, in which case they will uh, look behind the document. But on its face, 99.99% um, uh, of the time, um, a simple self-declaration of origin uh, will meet that requirement. Another example, getting your goods uh, to China um, often requires transiting through a third country. Um, and it's always a challenge, obviously, for New Zealand um, when we're very distant from markets. Uh, trade agreements uh, tend to have a lot of rules around uh, what exporters, what traders have to do to demonstrate that their goods um, when they have transited through a third country, um, have not um, been broken up, have not been had value added. Um, so in order to retain the New Zealand origin, there is often some additional documentation requirements from that third country uh, customs authority required. What we've done in the upgrade um, is streamline that, streamline that process um, and put a lot more emphasis on uh, existing commercial documentation, uh, enabling exporters um, to uh, simply rely on their existing commercial documentation uh, to prove that their goods, um, even though it's transited through a third country, um, is still a New Zealand good. So those kinds of practical rules, um, I think, will be um, you know, useful for our goods exporters. On the services side, um, additional commitments by China in a number of new sectors. Um, about 23 additional sectors now uh, are covered by uh, China's commitments uh, in the free trade agreement. Some of the uh, existing sectors uh, from the 2008 agreement have um, had commitments improved by China. Um, and also um, there have been um, a significant uh, improvement in what's called the most favoured nation commitment by China and by New Zealand, um, which really protects the competitive position of our services exporters. Um, and so it says that if China or New Zealand in the future um, provides um, better treatment for a third country, then that treatment automatically will flow through uh, to the New Zealand, um, New Zealand companies. So, um, you know, that's some examples really of, of, the, of the commercial um, improvements from the upgrade. Um, in addition to that, there is, of course, the whole strategic piece. And I think, you know, to be honest, um, I think the strategic, uh, uh, the strategic improvements are probably what's the most valuable thing from the upgrade. And we've heard a lot this morning about um, the situation um, with challenges to globalization, uh, some of the challenges to the uh, international rules-based system, um, how important that rules-based system is for New Zealand, a small country, um, you know, distant from markets, really reliant upon those rules. 
Um, and um, in that context, um, being able to get um, a new set of trade rules agreed with a major economy like China uh, sends a really uh, helpful signal, um, signal of uh, that international cooperation in, in the economic area is still possible, um, and a signal of, of both countries' um, uh, commitment to move forward in, in this area. So that's sort of a strategic benefit, which I think um, will have real value, um, you know, measured um, in decades rather than um, immediate. Barney, I did ask you this last night, but um, given the maturity of the relationship and the agreement, is there any more you can squeeze out of having a look at this again, or would that just be work for consultants? Well, um, I think it is important to continue to invest in our trade and economic relationships. So um, the trading environment will continue to change, of course, and so it is quite, I think, quite possible, maybe even quite likely, that um, five, ten years' time, we will want to have another look at this agreement um, and perhaps um, go through another modernisation process, um, bringing in some, some new issues. If we're talking about, um, you know, those very, what's actually very small uh, areas of market access that are still outstanding, um, I don't think that um, you know, further upgrading the bilateral FTA is going to uh, provide improvements in those areas. Um, but you know, where we might be able to get some improvements will be um, through some of our plurilateral agreements. So like CPTPP is a good example. Um, so were China to continue with its interest of joining CPTPP, um, then that does provide um, an opportunity uh, to address you know, some of the few remaining sensitive issues from the original agreement. We have some questions here, so um, I'll start from, start from the top. Um, anonymous, our traditional allies don't open their markets to us like China, as you point out, yet we criticise them so much. Why do we bite the hand that feeds us? Well, I think I'm the wrong person to, um, to respond to that. Um, I, mean, I guess I would just um, you know, reflect on um, you know, some of the comments made um, by our Prime Minister this morning um, and by the former Prime Ministers as well, um, which I think um, you know, really does respond to that question. Question here, uh, Barney, um, Bank of China has been developing a digital currency to replace cash. What kind of process can be circulated in New Zealand from our POVI? Yeah, um, that's a very um, detailed question, um, and that kind of gets into, um, for example, what some of the financial services commitments that both countries have made um, in the trade agreement. Um, those kinds of issues um, are potentially covered in the agreement, but it's, um, you know, it's going to be a question of detail and, and looking, um, looking quite specifically at that. I'll do my final question from Todd Muller. When do you expect China to formally ratify the upgrade so it enters into force and provides those opportunities for New Zealand exporters? Yeah, so, um, I mean, the process for, um, New Zealand's process for ratification um, of a trade agreement and uh, any international treaty um, is that um, the agreement goes through what's called parliamentary treaty examination, where um, a, par a parliament committee, um, the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Select Committee, um, of which Mr Miller um, sits, um, examines the treaty um, and um, makes a, um, a recommendation um, to Parliament. Um, thereafter, uh, the government must pass any law or legislation required for New Zealand to implement the treaty. Um, and after that step has been taken, uh, New Zealand is in a, in a position to ratify. So in terms of where New Zealand is at, the treaty examination process has concluded. Um, in relation to the upgrade, actually, New Zealand has not made any commitments in the upgrade which require us to change um, our laws or regulations. So all of the commitments that New Zealand has made um, is covered by um, our existing policy and by existing regulations. So New Zealand, in fact, with the completion of parliamentary treaty examination, um, is in a position now to move ahead and ratify, um, and we will seek to coordinate the timing of that with China. 
Uh, China does uh, have a little bit more to do to ratify because they do need to change uh, some of their regulations. In particular, they need to change their tariff regulation to implement uh, the additional tariff cuts uh, which they've agreed to under the upgrade. So I'm hoping that um, China will be in a position um, to conclude that process before the end of this year um, that will enable ratification um, you know, by the end of this year and entry into force um, by the beginning of next year. Thank you, Barney. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please join with me in thanking Barney Riley for his contribution this afternoon.